Um, welcome uh, to probably one of the uh, the most um, I wouldn't say difficult, but most exciting lecture in this series, um, in this semester's lecture series. I uh, we have uh, Rachel will uh, formally introduce our speaker, uh, but I just want to share with you two secrets, which is very rare. I want to share with you. Many years ago, when I was a student um, at Penn, um, uh, somebody was my professor, uh, first semester, first studio. And I was assigned to this guy who speaks English that's hardly understood by anybody, let alone a guy from China. And the second day, and then this professor asked me, do you have a car? And I said, yeah, I do have a car. Can you go along with me to do something? I said, yeah, I'll do it. So then we drove to far away a place uh, to get a driver license. <laughs> and it happened that I only spent about 2000, uh, about uh, 1940, no, 1978, uh, a Nissan. At that time, it's called Datsun. It's a station wagon, uh, no lights were working. <laughs> So we didn't know that actually the car has to be inspected on the spot to be allowed to take the license exam. At that time, I was driving. This professor sat next to me in passenger side. And then I was directed out the car saying, come out, see, this car, uh, see the, your lights. And I said, well, why do you drive a car here? Do you don't have no lights working. I said, oh, I didn't know you have to check this. And then just I was like arguing with the police officer. Then there's another car coming up beh from behind, and another officer goes, move the car, move the car. And then my professor, I move around and take the driver's seat and move the car about two, 10 meters away to uh, yield to another car. And then another police officer says, you are disqualified. I'm like, why? You have no driver license <laughs> to move the car 10 meters away. Then my professor steps out of the car and says, what a place, it's a lawless, it's a lawless place. <laughs> well, about half a year ago, uh, that was James, by the way. <laughs> about half a year ago, he received an uh, award uh, of doing a big city, a big new portion of the city in Shenzhen. And he had a great time there, but nonetheless, it was very difficult. Uh, negotiation of a contract and understanding of the city and then he called me and says hey uh, Ma, is Shenzhen a lawless place? <laughs> is Shenzhen a lawless place? And I said no it is a country that is famous for its law <laughs> and you'll be okay with the laws in Shenzhen but it seems like everywhere he goes it seems lawless. <laughs> okay whether he has an ultra ability to define the laws by his own system or have a very good strategy to violate it. And so we'll see how, how he is going to violate the laws he has set up. I don't know what it's called, but we all went through the last 10 years or 20 years of landscape has come up with new laws or regu reg regulating systems to deal with land and cities. With that being said, I just want to pass on. I felt I am obligated to show you this lawless story. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, I think you know who our speaker is already, so I'll keep the introduction very short. Um, it's good to see so many people in here. Um, one of the things I want to announce is that James Corner is here tonight as a distinguished visiting professor in landscape architecture, which is a program that was recently set up by our director, Bob Harris, in the landscape architecture program. Um, so just a couple things about James. I think you all know quite a bit about him. That's why you're here. Um, he said I could go back as far as his MLA, but not to talk about his undergrad. <laughs> but <laughs> so obviously he, um, he taught at UPenn, but before then he actually went there in the mid 80s. He got an MLA and did an urban design certificate. So he's long practiced kind of that synthetic design work that he's really come to be known for. You'll know, too, his um, firm, Field Operations, which he is the principal of in New York. And then just um, a couple of other quick highlights. Um, hopefully, many of you guys have read his essays. 
He's well known in the field of contemporary landscape architecture theory and exposition. In fact, he's done more to shape it than I think anybody else in the field. And um, certainly, if you don't know him by name, but I hope everybody in here does, you should know him by some of his, his best known projects, including the High Line in New York and Fresh Kills out in Staten Island. So I'll keep it to that. And I'd like to introduce James Corner. How do we uh, get the lights down here? Well, if Dean Moore wants to tell stories, there's, uh, where, where, where do I begin? I, I could actually, uh, I could forget this whole presentation and just fill, tell you uh, some wonderful stories about Dean Moore. <laughs> Firstly, he, as a student, he was an exceptional uh, drafts person. He drew beautifully. Remember that, was, uh, that you had a whole range of pencil um, densities from the H through the Bs. And uh, he, he was a master draftsman, super fast, super capable. And um, he was also a, uh, a very good, um, how, how to put it? You were very good at appropriating a range of uh, things very, and, and then collating them into one. So he would have on his book, I, I don't know if any of you know the architect Peter Salter at the time, but Peter Salter was drawing these incredibly um, precise technical drawings. And then on the other hand, there was people like, like OMA with their cartoon drawings. And Ma was a genius sort of combining these, these two things the diagrammatic cartoon and the super precise technical drawing. Um, so, lots of stories. When I asked him about the lawlessness in Shenzhen, he said, um, you just need to take a tall, beautiful Western woman with you who smokes. And I said, why? He said, because A, they, they don't know what to do with tall Western women, and when they go out of the room to sort of speak secretly and quietly together, They'll want a cigarette, and if she can go out and smoke with them, she'll completely diffuse uh, them making any sort of sense. So, <laughs> seeing as I'm going to Shenzhen next week, I'm actually taking a tall Western woman with me who smokes. <laughs> and it is a lawless place. I don't care what, what, what you say. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I just thought I'd, I'd show some works that are sort of current. Um, it's not really a deep theory lecture. It's more um, about some, some projects that keep us very busy in the office. They're, all the projects I'm going to show are public projects. And uh, if I've learned anything over the past 10 years in practice, um, uh, it's a game, being able to try to design and be creative about, about the design of public social space. But, there are so many people involved. There are so many um, decision makers. There's no single king, no single president, no single authority. It's always uh, a sort of populism, perhaps an ad hoc populism. It's not always a highly organized or uh, predictable sequence of events. And I think as a designer, you know, you always want to do cool stuff and, and do the best that you can. But we are always in this public setting. So one of the things I want to try and highlight going through these projects are some of the things you have to do to maintain creativity and at the same time navigate this, this field of, of complex relationships. The second thing is um, a sort of uh, acknowledgement that at the end of the day, the design of public spaces are really about people and designing you know, rather theatrical and spectacular settings for the performance of civic life and for people to feel that they have uh, an opportunity to interact and engage in new and fresh ways. And so therefore, perhaps the design is about staging, you know, setting the stage for the, for, for, for the performance of these things. And maybe a third thematic is a sort of pragmatism, and that is to say that certain um, certain geometries and materials and how you conceive of the design actually have a performative aspect in that, that, that they're actually doing something, doing something useful. 
Um, and so there's a sort of a practicality at work too. So I think those three threads or those three themes, you know, the, the whole idea of a, of a public theater, um, the idea of social space, and the idea of uh, a, a sort of performative pragmatism, I think should, should, should come through as we go through this uh, kind of quickly. Now, the High Line, of course, is, 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 is a project that's uh, of much acclaim. It runs for a mile and a half across the west side of Manhattan. And uh, on the left, you see what that elevated railroad structure once was. It was, it was an elevated freight rail line. Um, and then when the train stopped running, um, seeds that were sown mostly by birds and, and by the wind generated this wonderful sort of meadow. And what was magical about it is nobody knew it was there because it was up in the sky, 30 feet, Nobody had any idea it was there. All, all that they could see was the steel structure below. But sure, there were a few residents and apartments that could see it, um, and there were a few illicit drug users that would go up there on, on occasion. But in, in general, in the general public consciousness in their imagination, the, 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 the idea of this green ribbon in the sky was just not in their minds. Instead, it was seen as a very derelict, dangerous, dark, dank, useless structure that should be pulled down. Um, but I think this image is really spectacular because when we, when we did actually get on it to walk it for the first time as part of the design work, I was very struck by the singularity of this green ribbon and the whole experience that all of the variation, the variety, the richness of the experience was really on the outside. And it was really the contrast between this very, very simple singular ribbon of green cutting through like a collage slice, cutting through this complexity that was on uh, uh, all around. The second thing was that it was an extraordinarily melancholic, ghostly, otherworldly sort of place. There was nobody else up there. It was, it was quiet compared to the hustle and bustle of, of Manhattan below. And, you know, particularly impressive was the, uh, just the texture, the color, the diversity of greenery. You know, it, it, was, it was a sort of a mostly a grassland, but uh, a lot of these grasses had very different textures and forms. They were growing at different rates. Uh, and according to very local microclimates, whether it's a little damper, a little drier, a little sunnier, a little shadier, the whole ecology was very, uh, was, was very dynamic and very varied. And then there was this sort of dialogue between the greenery and the hard, the hard stuff, if you will. I mean, it was built as a steel structure with a concrete deck with only 12 inches of stone ballast and then the wood sleepers and the steel tracks. So it was all concrete and steel and stone and nature somehow f got a foothold and it was really impressive how nature uh, was able to sort of bleed and blend and integrate in very creative ways with this, with this found object. So there were a lot of influences on the imagination about you know, how to create now a new public landscape and how to have an attitude that maybe you know, rather than design, um, design being something that draws attention to itself, Maybe design should be about trying to amplify and concentrate certain found conditions that we had here. Namely, the singularity, the consistency of, ex, uh, of, the, of the High Line as a sort of found object, and this dialogue between nature and the post-industrial. So we said at the very beginning, let's just keep it, and let's try and think how, uh, how to create a public landscape while not destroying what we have. Of course, one of the problems is the High Line is very narrow. It's only about 30 to 40 feet across. And if the red line here indicates you know, what would be required for a, a pedestrian path. So this was, for us, at the very beginning, the primary problem, how to create a pathway that's safe for the public to walk on, but at the same time, how to integrate that pathway with the rail bed landscape. And that led to uh, a series of ideas for how to sort of split uh, a paving approach, 
and to develop an idea towards um, uh, constructing a paved surface that's actually uh, tapers, bleeds, blends, and actually creates cracks and openings where, the, where uh, nature can bleed through. And using that vocabulary, if these were to, we imagine these early on to be uh, precast concrete elements, we could combine them in different ways in order to create all sorts of different uh, biotopes, all sorts of different uh, landscapes, if you will, different ratios between hard and soft, different uh, measures of scales of space between the, the uh, ratio of the paving to the ratio of the landscape, and create all sorts of different uh, textures and effects, while at the same time maintaining a very continuous singular language. Um, and then that led to a whole series of layouts and trying to uh, organize this thing and design it as a choreography with very special regard for certain viewpoints and vistas and experiences. So we really mapped the, the high line every sort of 10 feet in terms of what was on either side and what your uh, vista and vantage points were. And then the path became a sort of designed choreography along that line. The path was also technology, though. Um, it's uh, open joint and it's open underneath, so that when it rains, the water is actually collected underneath, and then the um, subgrade is, is graded or sloped so that that collected water is, is drained very slowly through the planting beds. The drains that carry away excess water were purposefully positioned at the very edges of the high line, so every drop of water that falls on the high line has to make its way through the soil of the planting bed before it gets to the drain. And in actual fact, um, we've since found out that 90, more than 95% of rain that falls on the high line stays on the high line. So it's really a, a sort of a self-sustaining landscape and there's very little that actually has to be drained off. It was also imagined as a system that was very flexible. In other words, if the parks department found that the path wasn't big enough or it was too big or too small in certain areas, these different elements could be pulled and, and, and picked out uh, in time. Um, and you see here the design of the tapers with a little, um, a little ridge that had to be designed because, again, we were under a lot of pressure to have uh, fencing, to build fencing into this design to actually protect the planting areas. And we worked hard to show how you could modulate or modify the precast concrete in such a way that it deterred uh, continuous movement. Um, and then these, these precast elements were carefully designed. There's a catalog of 24 different elements. Um, uh, a choice of aggregate was made, and then they were uh, prefabricated in, in Canada. There's a careful layout here. There's lots of other subtexts here to do with uh, expansion, and uh, 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 expansion and contraction that's differential because the high line itself is like a bridge that expands and contracts. And then the paving is actually floating on top of that with its own coefficient of, uh, of uh, expansion. So there's a lot of other little details that play out in how this surface is actually made to deal with that. Um, this just shows some of the uh, construction of how all of that is put together and then the construction of the thing in terms of the removal of the old landscape, the reconstruction of the new, the laying down of the beds and then finally the paving, the uh, re, re uh, placement of the rail tracks that float above that. And then subsequently, all of this void space was filled in with uh, drainage layers, soil, and planting. And, you know, these were carefully thought through details in terms of how the rail tracks can actually blend and integrate with the paving, and how the grasses, this was at the very beginning when they were first planted, how they can actually uh, bleed through these openings. And so this dialogue, if you will, between this new uh, uh, technical surface on this rail bed landscape that's supposed to grow in a wild and effusive and dynamic way through the openings and the cracks. This is an early photograph of that 
and, uh, and so on. The furniture too was conceived as part of this system, uh, again in an effort to lend consistency so that we could design a landscape that's ultimately a mile long um, and there's a consistency in terms of vocabulary. Um, these uh, elements were uh, bunched together in certain ways in order to promote uh, different types of socialization so people can sit and face in different directions and begin to form uh, social groups and social settings. And I think that was an intention in the design, but I have to say the, the range, the sheer range of ways in which people have appropriated the furniture exceed, exceeded, uh, exceeds our original expectations. It's just extraordinary how people do it. So as a sort of a walk uh, from the south end at Gansevoort Street, uh, the staircase is designed to go through the structure with an idea that um, you're drawing somebody up from the city, you're slowing their sense of pace down, and then you're brought through the, the depth, sectional depth of the structure, which is significant. The beams are five to six feet deep. So to actually draw people through that section was part of the idea of, 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 of leaving the hardscape below, emerging up, seeing the sky framed, and then coming into a very significant scale space where you actually have panoramic views uh, across to the river a big sense of the sky, more so than you do in the, in the street below, and a sense of greenery, and this sort of, this sort of rail bed landscape reappropriated now as a promenade. Um, you know, it's a long story, but the High Line was part of an economic redevelopment initiative on the west side, and all of these new buildings, the, the uh, Frank Gehry building, the Jean Nouvel tower behind that, uh, an Annabelle Seldorf uh, a condominium building, and many others have gone up since. The city spent $150 million on the High Line, and I think they have already recouped nearly a billion from uh, economic development uh, in this area that in part has been instigated and, and propagated by, by the success of the High Line as a sort of an identifiable um, place now in the consciousness of Manhattan. And it really is just, you know, the way it's used, again, it exceeds our expectations. I remember meetings early on where people thought that the story of the planting and the paving and the furnishing was just too soft. Uh, what are the attractions going to be? Why will people come up here? And we were just uh, uh, insistent that the attraction is the thing itself and to just try to be authentic about what it, what it means to be 30 feet in the air enjoying these sorts of vistas and apertures and niches and relationship to found spaces in the city will be a fantastic attraction but it took a long time for people to believe that and now even to this day it's still a very popular um, place hundreds of thousands of people over the year um, and a planting palette that is very dynamic in terms of winter, fall, uh, spring and summer to make sure that people keep coming back because every week different things are in bloom, there's different colors, different textures, different things to see. It really begins to function like a magnificent garden, extraordinarily dynamic, uh, over 7,000 species um, oh, sorry, over 7,000 plants and 700 species uh, are on the high line. And this juxtaposition, really, between nature sort of, you know, as an emergent, uh, dynamic, wild entity, juxtaposed against some of the post-industriality as well as some of the new, more contemporary uh, aspects of the city. And this is a great view to, to, you know, to be able to see these sorts of plants, these sorts of flowers, the extraordinary scents and color and texture, bees buzzing around, birds nesting, all now in the context of you know, one of the densest cities in the world. The planting palette was very carefully conceived between us and uh, a wonderful Dutch horticulturalist, P. Tudolf. And um, 
you know, a big part of the idea was that the planting pellet should not be cut down in the winter. It should be allowed to simply be and assume texture and assume a sort of brittleness that allows for frost and snow to actually uh, take special form on these things. One of the features um, that is a sort of a destination on the High Line is called the 10th Avenue Square. It's where the High Line moves from a linear element to a square element as it passes over 10th Avenue. And here it, the surface change to a, changes to a wood platform with a sort of a seating amphitheater that is cut into the steel structure to create a window that looks north up 10th Avenue. But at the same time, from the street below, you're looking at people in the window. You see the mannequin in the shop window below and the people in the window above. It's really a signal and a cue to people below that there is this public space above. It also tends to theatricalize uh, um, uh, or make, make a spectacle out of people um, being framed in this way. So the, the window really works two ways, between sort of people on the High Line looking out and the frame that that makes, as well as being seen from below. And this has been, again, an enormously successful social space. There are concerts uh, given in this amphitheater, uh, impromptu performances, uh, weddings, um, and people just occasionally bringing champagne and strawberries and just sitting here with their date or with their friends. And again, you can see the sheer uh, diversity of people that are drawn to this place and to this setting. Um, another area is, the, we call it the sun deck, uh, with these big chaise lounges that were designed to face southwest with great views across the river. Some of these are on wheels and can actually move up and down on the tracks. And again, we saw this as a sort of a social setting, a social stage, where we knew people would love to hang out, but I'm telling you, we never expected the sheer range of, um, of ways in which those chaises are used. There's a number of areas where um, the High Line goes underneath structure, and here it's just really simply lit with this neon blue. It lights the volume in an almost James Turrell-like way. And these are great spaces, they're just tough, real spaces, but they lend themselves to events, to lectures, to concerts, to films, uh, and to private parties. Um, these, are the, these are the sun beds, the sun decks, you see people lounging here, people sitting in them in different ways, meeting new friends, um, kissing, sunbathing, sleeping, reading books, talking, eating, drinking, lounging. It's just an amazing um, uh, spectrum of uses. And here when they're full, people even throw a towel down on the path and uh, begin to colonize that too. Um, uh, da, 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 keep, keep going through this. Um, in section two, which is opening in a month's time, um, is another 10 blocks. It's a very different section. I'm not allowed to show you slides because there's a moratorium on images as they're trying to, um, trying to build the, uh, the buzz for the opening. Um, but there are some ideas. One of these is, um, is a sort of a frame that looks down over the street, um, a viewing deck over a cutout uh, over 30th Street. The cutout allows light to the street below. It reveals the sort of uh, intense engineering structure. It's a bit of a Gordon Matter Clark piece that's been sort of uh, uh, to reveal the structure and to create this viewing deck that looks um, east and west. There's a large sort of uh, seating performance stage element on one of the spurs with this uh, birch aspen stand. Um, and an elevated catwalk that actually is a steel catwalk eight feet above the High Line that brings the visitor or the walker uh, to a new elevation, a pretty dramatic elevation. Now you're really high uh, and there's a couple of moments where you'll get real vertigo. But the idea here is to really um, uh, create a woodland 
uh, to bring back a woodland that used to be in this particular location and to actually have an elevated walk through that. So the High Line, you know, has been sort of returned to this, to this green ribbon that cuts ecologically through the city but is now socialized, a new social instrument for people to enjoy, engage, meet, and, uh, you know, sort of, I mean, uh, it's just amazing to me that we all live in cities to, because of the buzz you have with other people, and when you can design an instrument like this, it only sort of amplifies what it means to be social and urban. And all at the same time, in close juxtaposition to, you know, the phenomena of nature that has been sort of eradicated from the city or sterilized in the form of just a handful of street trees or something, or generic parks, to actually be able to bring uh, uh, a, a fresh, dynamic, vibrant, vital, colorful range of natural experiences in close juxtaposition to the urban is a strong, um, a strong idea. Some of the work on the High Line led to this planning project that we um, led for a proposal for Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards is the rail yards um, at the head, at the northernmost part of the High Line, uh, where the High Line takes a turn and moves west along the river. Um, and a bid was put out for developers to develop this in a very, very dense way with a mix of commercial, residential, new institutional, and a hotel and a school and significant public spaces. Um, but it, uh, to cut a long story short, if, the, if you look at this plan, you can see the High Line is running up from the bottom, then it runs uh, west to the river and then along the front. The, all of the development plans uh, proposed to erase the High Line in this section. They sort of took the stance that there's enough High Line, you've got 20 blocks of it south. We're going to do big buildings here, we need those buildings to front the street, and we need the entrances to those buildings to front the street, and the High Line's in the way. So we're, we're going to take it down, and uh, in our proposal we said no. Let, let's keep the High Line and let's actually push the buildings back. Let's create a linear park here so that the, the uh, line of residential towers that are proposed there will actually have an address on the park, a park that's at grade with, with retail and uh, restaurant bases that spill out into that park. The High Line can fly across and, and actually give this development an address. Um, and we did some other things, such as uh, moving the buildings back in order to allow this corner to uh, enjoy southwest sunlight. Um, it sounds obvious, you know, uh, you know, create a linear park, push the buildings back, have southwest exposure, but the um, uh, development plan we were working against you know, was, 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 was not recognizing any of those factors at all and was pushing the buildings all over the place maximizing shadow, uh, creating wind tunnels, and just having no idea of, of how the configuration of uh, building footprints and building mass uh, has a relationship to the quality of public open space. Um, so here we show the High Line beginning to open up with openings to this lower park um, and in relationship now to a sort of much more vital um, ground floor um, programming of those buildings. Um, seeing as I'm here in, Santa, in, in, in Los Angeles, I should show you what we're doing in Santa Monica. Um, this is a park we've been invited to do. Um, the uh, white building on the right-hand side of that orange uh, square is City Hall. Then the green patch in front is, is called Town Square. And then the other area is to become a new park. And it's a pretty significant location because it is really potentially the heart of Santa Monica, although it really has to deal with the gash or the divide that's created by the freeway. On the north side, you see the sunken freeway there, which, t which really separates sort of what is, what is the main commercial 
core of Santa Monica from the more residential area to the south. Uh, and then the whole nexus and relationship to the pier and Palisades Park along the beach. So, you know, here we are in a central location in relationship to the beach, the pier, the Palisades Park, both the north and south sides of Santa Monica, but at the same time having to deal with the gash of the freeway, an overscaled street intersection, and a whole series of other elements that, um, that, that limit the potential of this site. Um, this, if any of you know Santa Monica, it's an extraordinarily um, talkative place. Uh, it's really heavy on uh, public participation and public process, and there's an awful lot of skepticism uh, on the part of the public about design. Is, is design elitist? You know, is it, is, it, uh, is it being done at the exclusion of what we, the people, really want? Um, and so we had to design this not simply as a, as a cool design, but as something that is integrated with public process and reflects the process in an iterative manner. In order to sort of get started, we did some research on the site and found out that it was once um, a uh, river arroyo with a train line running in the lower part of that arroyo and that's ultimately what formed the pier and you can see the, the topographic configuration here between the arroyo um, braids the rail line and the pier and washes these this is an image of a of a general wash this is when you get flood water coming off the hills and the mountains and it hits a plane and it creates a planar wash. And what it does is it creates this very, very braided uh, sort of landscape. So one of the schemes we developed was this sort of braided uh, geometry that uses the paths to actually connect key places and braids the project from a formal orientation outside of City Hall and then makes it into a much more informal um, landscape as you as you go closer to the beach um, and this was one sort of set of diagrams that really just had to do with uh, a geometrical organization uh, themed around the idea of the Arroyo wash and what it might look like just in terms of a circulation system a soft to hard system and a canopy system At the same time we developed a second scheme called the sort of we call this the ravine, and it was really had to do with uh, creating two very high landforms that would create vista overlooks, one looking northwest across the beach to the ocean, and one looking the other way to City Hall and to the institutional district. And the idea that you would walk between these very strong landforms in a more ravine type of landscape. And again, there's, an, uh, there's a different idea here to do with circulation and connectivity, the ratio of softscape to hard, the canopy relationship. And then a third uh, diagram was this one, which had to do with trying to not have direct lines, but to actually create a much more in intricate landscape with hills and hollows, niches and little hideaways. Uh, a very sectional place with um, uh, a sort of a path system and a landscape system that are sectionally working very differently um, and a sort of a patterning like this. Now, those three um, schematics were very useful for engaging the public in a, in a, in a, in a deep and informative way. Rather than just asking the public what they want as a sort of a blind uh, laundry list of, of desires, we put three things on the table um, and we talked about the pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses of each, and that is what uh, allowed for a more sophisticated type of conversation with the public to occur. As a result of that, the three or certain elements of the three schemes almost blended. You can see here that predominantly the first scheme is the general uh, geometry with this braided uh, series of, of, of places. Um, but 
you see the nose land form is part of the ravine idea where we have an elevated overlook and there's a series of gardens and sectional uh, conditions that really are drawn from the third scheme. And so this now uh, has started to take real shape. Um, it allows us to go back. We've been now through six uh, public meetings. <laughs> and uh, every time we hear things and we come back with the next iteration that uh, is in, in, in many ways responsive to the things that we've heard. Um, and this is the way that is now taking form and with uh, a whole series of ideas. One of these ideas that I really like and a lot of people there really like is this idea of elevated uh, overlooks. Um, they're themed around an idea of picture postcards where you get these sorts of um, uh, uh, cantilevered uh, decks which take in certain key views of the ocean, of the beach, of Palisades Park. And this physical model those um, shell forms that you see are now these overlooks. And what's good about those is from the street side, as you're looking into the park, the park now has some iconography or something that is a gateway or an element that, um, that signals to people that this is a public place, it's an inviting place, and there are people framed inside the overlooks as well uh, as, as looking out. Uh, now, I think, you know, when you think about it, who'd have thought that something formally that uh, adventurous, you'd get away with it in Santa Monica. But in actual fact, you know, because we went through the process, we, we were, it was an authentic process. People uh, have bought into this. They really like this, and uh, we're moving ahead with it. And now it's at a point of sort of technical development where these shells and landforms and planting vocabulary is being made. We also have an idea to sort of be really, really ambitious with horticulture, so that rather than just a handful of typical trees and shrubs and grasses, that really, you know, how adventurous can we be? How big can we get trees? How can we mix um, some really unusual and bold and striking tree forms? In this case, the umbrella pine mixed over to the side with uh, some native sycamore and other species that, that, that you wouldn't normally see in combination in Southern California with a really interesting grass and perennial landscape below. And uh, working closely with uh, Southern Californian horticulturalists, uh, Bob Perry and um, uh, John Greenlee to you know, really develop a planting palette here that is extraordinarily dynamic um, and interesting and fresh and something that brings a sense of the horticultural back to public space rather than just the general, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the typical greenery and some other things going on. There. A very similar project in Cleveland where we take this um, a traffic intersection. Um, we're not allowed to do anything with the streets. We somehow have to make sense of these, make sense of these four quadrants, and so we simply build a landform over those, and then scallop out a series of public spaces at ground level, while also rising up to a hilltop crest in the middle. And this too uh, is is moving ahead. Again, in a very difficult, complicated public political environment, it's difficult to get interesting things done, but we've managed to, again, through a sort of sense of pragmatism and a, a good communication, we've managed to get this um, moving forward. Next is the city in Shenzhen that uh, Dean Ma uh, spoke about. Um, now, this city is massive. It's for five million people. It's uh, five square miles. It's presently uh, rice paddies and landfill on the coast of Shenzhen, uh, which is part of the Pearl River Delta. Um, here you see it in relationship to Hong Kong, and just, just above the label there, Hong Kong, is the heart of Shenzhen. 
and you can see that it's an inland heart and they want to move that to the west in order to connect to the coast and to connect to a new um, light rail system that's moving north from Hong Kong north and into the Pearl River Delta. So for Shenzhen, it's a very strategic site. It's a waterfront site. Uh, they want to build a very dense city, the density of Manhattan and Hong Kong, uh, with the same sort of mix and the same relationship between business and commerce uh, and residential and hotels and institutions. And they want to do it very quickly. Um, this is part of, the, of, part of that urban uh, regional system and the, the diagram here showing the desire of the city to move west and the uh, link between Hong Kong and Pearl River Delta to the north. This is the site today. You can see it's mostly old agricultural land with a, a lot of uh, landfill uh, going into the bay. And this is it, your typical, uh, I call it your typical Chinese landscape. <laughs> Gray sky sort of blips of, uh, blips, of, blips of mountains and an awful lot of surface area with big buildings that seem lost. And this is what they have in their mind's eye. They want this. They want Hong Kong or Sydney or New York. Um, in fact, if you overlay the site on Manhattan, it's this big. So it's really the size of uh, Manhattan south of Central Park all the way down to the down to the battery so that's how big this place is and um, how uh, ambitious it is to move forward so you know how do you structure it how do you give it a sense of framework how do you begin to think about structuring this big site for a massive amount of development we began by looking at these five uh, tributaries, these five rivers. Um, they're all polluted. They are all flood prone. Um, and they kind of, you know, creep through the site in a, in a very sad way. But we thought, what if we were to actually take these fingers and make them into big biological machines that actually process the water, remediated the water, improved the water quality, uh, and at the same time, they, were also, they could also be the central parks or the main public spaces around which the city could be organized. So this idea of reclaiming the water and creating a public realm around these five fingers. And these five fingers could be designed in such a way that the um, polluted water from the inland is actually being um, stored filtered through natural systems, the water quality is being improved before it's released into the bay, and at the same time dealing with flood waters from the bay um, and, and the different uh, uh, water levels. So that led to the idea of beginning to sculpt and shape these fingers in a, in a muscular way so that they're three-dimensional. And you can see in the shaping here, there's a, a, a ideas for pathways, for uh, terraces, for uh, amphitheater type situations, for large surfaces that could hold water at certain times of the year and be available for recreational uses at other times of the year. And that that uh, sculptural form, if you will, is built up out of a series of um, elements with uh, concrete uh, walls and structures to the wetlands, to the fields, to the path system to small structures, bridges, and kiosks. So, you know, that this was the idea that somehow these are like machines, the water comes into them, it, 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 it shapes this uh, landscape, and these become the new public parks um, that would shape the development. And, of course, you know, there's a lot of sculptural and formal potential for these uh, landscapes to take on a very strong physical form and to integrate them with water and with the watery landscape. Um, and then there's this idea that there's sort of 
recreational uses, park uses are integrated with the engineering function and the water processing function of these places. So here you see, you know, the idea of you, you're up at the street level, there's linear parks, they're more urban, but as you go down and deeper into the cross section of these fingers, they get wetter, they're more wild, they're more, more, uh, more working with, with, uh, with water. So these fingers then create the framework for um, a series of urban districts. So again, uh, the fingers are useful to begin to break down the fabric and be able to say that there's now five urban districts. And these urban districts have various programmatic uh, and architectural uh, functions. So here we have A, B, C, D, E. There's a total area in terms of building, FAR. Uh, but at the same time, we were really struggling, I think we still are, with how to do uh, an urban design plan that at the same time fosters and promotes mix rather than just repetitive blocks with repetitive guidelines. How do you actually uh, have a plan that isn't lawless, <laughs> but at the same time allows and promotes a certain type of lawlessness in terms of mix. So there's this idea of sort of thinking about urban, um, urban structuring uh, at a series of different levels. So rather than viewing buildings as singular, they're viewed as if they're a sort of geology with a, with a ground floor where we want to pay the most attention uh, and then a podium, and then a series of towers or slabs or other elements that go above that. And, and using that to uh, promote the uh, sort of mix. So in one of these districts, for example, this is really the commerce, commercial and business district. The block structure is dimensioned in such a way, the bases are made in such a way that you're beginning to promote mix between uh, commerce and residential. In this area, the lifestyle uh, district is a different kind of combination. Um, in the trade and logistics area, it's a different kind of uh, typology, block structure, type and size and mix, and in this area, and so on. So what we're getting to is a sort of an urban um, design structure where we're trying to get around what typically happens in China, which is a monolithic block structure with repetitive formulaic uh, building types. By creating um, uh, a geometrical framework and a sort of uh, catalog uh, framework that forces combination, forces mix. So for example, now zooming in, this is just one, uh, one section. Uh, to do with how fronts, uh, fronts might be organized, the towers on those bases would work, and how you begin to promote um, adjacency and mix, and so on. And again, relating all of those buildings to public open space at the ground level. So you can see here in the model uh, the relationship now between some of the urban massing in terms of mix and range of block type and block size and block structure. And again, the juxtaposition or the relationship between building faces and the public spaces. Um, a third component is this, is the idea of the hubs. This has to do with mass transit. There's a circular subterranean um, light rail system that works around the site and then for each district we said there should be a transit hub as a sort of civic centerpiece and that civic centerpiece should work sectionally with the transit have some sort of public uh, floor and float a building over that transit hub and that these hubs would become the iconic centerpieces for each district so each district gets a hub, but the hub is also a public space in, in, the, in the tradition of, of great train stations and other elements. And again, it's sort of a state-of-the-art uh, technology in terms of um, mass transit systems. 
Each, each district also gets a vocabulary of monuments. These are really the, the museums or some of the key elements like a financial tower where you do have some um, architectural distinction. Um, and these monuments are organized around the site in a certain way. So when you layer this project from the hy hydrological system and the parks and the open spaces through the urban design, the urban massing, and the urban texture, through the transit and the transportation scheme, and then the idea of some of the major institutional facilities on the waterfront, you're beginning to create um, uh, an organizational framework for a complex city to begin to emerge. And remember, when we make these presentations, it's, it's to a very complex uh, audience, many of whom are not designers. So the story that you tell has to have a certain uh, degree of legibility for them to be able to follow it and for it to make sense. These are just some renderings of some of the waterfront spaces um, and how these are being shaped. So what's interesting here is that they're moving ahead with this. And it's normally you would expect the transportation engineers to get first dibs. And all the investment and all the building would be about transportation. And then you'd probably get the property developers and the architects to build everything out. And then you'd end up with residual spaces that would become public open spaces afterwards. This project is the other way around. The public spaces are actually being built first. They're being, they're, they, they have the leading edge. And they are the defining elements that uh, add value and define quality for subsequent development to follow. So a lot of these views I'm showing of some of the waterfront projects are, are online already. The water fingers are already uh, um, uh, on target to be built. And all of this is happening before any kind of you know, uh, investment in transportation or in uh, building development. Building development will follow very quickly. They're eager to get going, and so too will transportation. But the whole idea of this city, which I think is really interesting, is it's really one big biological mixing machine. It works with water and ecosystems and environmental improvement. It's also um, a series of techniques for figuring out how to promote mix, and variation, and uh, richness in, urb in contemporary urban development. And at the same time, it takes, it, it, it's, it's uh, inclusive of transit issues, mobility issues, and other issues that are pertinent in this sort of project. Um, um, just finally, uh, Seattle is a city we're beginning to look at on the waterfront. Um, this was a logo we made for them um, in order to begin to inaugurate a new sense of identity. I'm not going to say too much about this in, in light of the time. I did just want to point out that um, it's this bay in the middle, Elliott Bay, that we're looking at. This is it. So this, this perimeter around the edge there is our project. And it's really great because the water body, in a sense, is the heart of the city, but no one knows it. They think the heart of the city is downtown, but really the bay and the life of the bay, the boats, the ferries, the... Um, uh, sort of the ethos too in Seattle culture of weather and environment and the salmon. Uh, there's a major salmon migra migratory route around the coastline. These are elements that are in Seattleites consciousness and so in a sense we're trying to reorient them away from an idea of downtown being the center of the city to the bay and the waterfront being the new image, the new face, the new identity for the city. And it's an amazingly beautiful, contrasting waterfront with this industrial port juxtaposed against, against nature, Mount Rainier in this case, uh, and the effects of weather. And this idea of the, uh, of the bay with these different uh, all-surrounding horizons. 
But I wanted to show you this slide because uh, if, uh, if we think they like to talk in Santa Monica, you should see what they like to do in Seattle. They love to, they love to really talk. And uh, we somehow have to mediate between all of these uh, sometimes uh, contested parties. The industrialists are generally more interested in freight, uh, in traffic, in business. Um, compare that to, say, the environmentalists who are really concerned about salmon habitat, the uh, water quality improvement, sustainability initiatives, the tension between the residents and the tourists. The residents uh, like their privacy, they like it just so, but on the other hand there's an increased demand for tourism. The locals, the tribes, the Native, um, Native Americans that have um, tribal sites or, or around this waterfront. When you start to understand that the, a, a design strategy here has to, has to bring all of these people along without excluding or upsetting any one of them. And that's part of what makes the work really interesting. This is part of that site. And finally, I just wanted to end with some really small scale things, because all, all these projects so far have been, have been pretty, pretty big. Um, but we're also you know, really interested in little things. This playground just opened in Memphis. Um, it's designed around this, this site that's a very small site. Um, and we did a kiddie workshop, and this is uh, 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 one child drawing a line which has to do with taking a journey around this site. And that led us to think about, you know, maybe, maybe we should make something that um, extends that journey and actually promotes and lengthens that journey. So we created a quarter mile long arbor that circles around the site and that provides shade for the parents to sit under and encircles a series of nests or play uh, nests and at the same time enhances the surrounding woodland and landscape and this structure simply meanders around the site. It's built out of uh, laser cut steel with each section being um, uh, uh, unique in terms of its sectional profile. So here's the catalog of elements and this is the idea that the arbor is really the walking device, the um, sort of funnel around which children and parents can run and hide. The parents can sit in the shade of this um, element. And then the play nests are where, where the children play. And this is it now built. It just opened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the planting has not yet grown up over the arbor, but it will um, within a few years. That will just be one big green hedge. and. Uh, providing shade and providing biodiversity and you can see the kids running through the arbor and jumping into some of the um, plainness. So there's an awful lot of detail here and an and, and, and imagination in terms of how this is made um, but I think it's an interesting juxtaposition to some of the bigger, bigger scale projects we just uh, spoke about. This pier, uh, Pier 11 in Philadelphia, is a, a very modest design, given a very modest budget, but it has an idea of a shifted uh, slope, a wedge, and here it is in construction. They're supposed to finish in three weeks' time. This picture was only taken a week ago, so they have a lot to do. But, <laughs> um, but the most, most of the structure is there, the trees are in, it's really just a case of surfacing and furnishing, and so I think they'll, they'll get that done. This is a really little project for a very small roof terrace, and um, by code, we're not allowed to go near the railing. We have to have three feet away from the railing, and this person wanted, uh, it wants to host a lot of parties on the, on the terrace, so it's really a project about furniture and furnishing as well as planting. The idea is, is to shape these sorts of um, furniture beds and furniture discs and then have the, uh, the, the, the planting containers in the center of these. 
and this is it in construction. These are all made out of um, laminate uh, mahogany. It's all um, laser cut and installed, and it's really quite beautiful. This, this is just happening now, so the plants haven't yet haven't yet gone in. But you can imagine, in a few weeks' time, it should look really beautiful. And these 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 pieces of furniture are exquisitely designed, and they're also exquisitely positioned to really take into consideration some of the views and vistas across the city. And finally, this project for the Winter Garden. If you know this, it's in Battery Park City. It's this big Caesar Pelly structure. The interior of it is sort of a bit Baroque with this polished marble floor and these palm trees are a bit sad. Um, and they're looking to retrofit this now, especially now that there's a subterranean connection over to the new, um, the new development over at Ground Zero. And so we had an idea of trying to extend the Winter Garden out to the river with a series of sort of pods that would be both inside the Winter Garden and then extend on a carpet out to the river. And these pods would actually hang from the top so that the all-important uh, idea of keeping the, the uh, floor open so that people can circulate and you can have very flexible uses on the floor, the idea of these hanging gardens allows you to uh, create this hanging garden effect while at the same time keeping the floor open. Um, and, you know, they're really quite extraordinary, little avatar-esque. Oh. This idea shows that you could hoist all of these elements up, and there's sort of a stage element by the, by the window there. There's a stage nest. You can hoist them all up, and therefore you can have a totally open and flexible floor. But you can also drop some of them down, and therefore you could have a more dynamic composition at different times, with some of them on the ground, and some of them mid-level, and some of them high-level. Or you could drop them all down. And then you can create a sort of a landscape on the floor that people actually have to walk through and walk around and have the stage. The stage can be lifted up or put down depending on the programming for that time. So here you have, for example, a daytime configuration or, or nighttime configuration. So it, it's a really cool idea in terms of creating an ambient, moody, green hanging garden setting, but it's also designed to be really flexible and accommodate different types of staging for different types of events. So this is just a, a view at the night time, the stage, the stage is down, um, the other elements are up in the air, some sort of performance with the western setting sun in the background, the hanging elements, people taking pictures, maybe a waterfall. Um, here the stage is down in the daytime, and you have these floating sort of things. And um, so I thought that's pretty cool to end on and to, again, compare these, these scale uh, approaches to scale where there are some pretty big projects and some pretty small projects but they all, at the end of the day, have to do with creating great stages for the playing out of social life. So thank you. Three questions. Um, do you need a microphone? Because uh, 
uh, because when when the function of the high line is transformed to transform from the railway to uh, open space, so is there some solutions to enhance this kind of connection? Have you have you visited it? Yes, I have visited. It. And did you, feel, did, you feel that, did you feel it separate from the city or disconnected from the city? Uh, at first, we are searching for the high line. Um, but we, we cannot find where it is, so... <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I would just say that I, I think, you know, on, on the one hand it is separate from the city, it's its own thing. It was built by engineers with an engineer mentality to just well, do its thing. And the buildings that went up around it were built by builder, builders and developers with their own agenda. And this, the buildings and the highlight turned their back on one another. They, were, they had two different functions. They were built with two different sets of agendas. They were completely separate. And I think that that separation is what makes it so powerful. It's a real collage. You know, collage is two things just in juxtaposition. Um, and again, there was a lot of pressure at the beginning to uh, connect buildings to the highlight to have cafes and bookstores and shops that all connected. And then we kept saying, well, if you do that, it's just going to be a street. It should be a street in the sky. I mean, it doesn't, you know, you, you know, leave all the galleries and the restaurants at the street level and have this disconnected, autonomous, uh, you know, wonderful linear garden standing separate. Um, so on the one hand, it is separate, and it should be. On the other hand, I think, just the exposure to the city. I mean, it is so connected in terms of the views, the vistas, the panoramas, the perspectives, um, the way in which you walk, the way in which you meet other people and bump into other people and interact with other people. I mean, it, it's so much an integral part of the city that, that you can't say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an autonomous element that has no relationship to the surrounding. Its relationship works in a collagic way, by virtue of collagic relationship, I suggest. Great. I had a question about your interaction with the architect, because if you read about the, uh, depending on if it's an architecture magazine or a landscape of architecture magazine, you get kind of equal billing for it. So I was just wondering if you could describe your interaction with the architect on Highline. Well, technically we're the lead designer, and we held the contracts, and we ran the project, and we ran the team, and we designed the project. Um, but we had a big team. Uh, and there was a video where we invited them to join our team. They were part of our team from the beginning. Um, most of their work was invested in the architectural elements, the stairs, the elevators, um, the 10th Avenue Square, which is the seating amphitheater. So, you know, there, there is by default a lot of collaboration and interaction and engagement that begins to um, lead to a collaborative framework. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we get equal billing, but uh, JCFO should always be cited first because we have a lead project. But, there, you know, it's not fair because there are others too. I mean, P2 Dolph, for his planting expertise, was an extraordinary part of this. Um, Love's Obertoire uh, with Hervé for lighting. You know, Hervé brought a, an amazingly poetic sense of lighting to how this thing should be. So, uh, Bureau Happel for engineering, which is, is mostly all technical, but it's actually really important in terms of how, of how the thing works uh, technically. So, uh, you know, there's many, many layers to this, and it's not. It's not fair to just sort of uh, say it belongs to one firm or another. We we uh, we led it, we coordinated it, we designed it, <coughs> and we had a big team. And it was at the end of the day a team, a team project, a team effort. A very maybe a quick one, Tasu. <coughs> um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about uh, why in this new work is a, a lot of what you showed was um, like an interesting growth structure. Obviously, it means uh, the same amount of well-scripting, you know, careful, rigorous thought. 
Um, it seems like we have to have uh, James back, uh, not for once, maybe for uh, multiple times. I know there are topics can be ranging from education to critical practice, that where he really uh, strives between, but also something that he has always been kind of advocating for the kind of action of mapping and then the strategy of plotting, where one half of it's always involved in generate, generating spaces and situations, the other is constantly re-generating uh, strategies and systems. We can really go into it. For me, um, in, I really want to um, thank him and also wishing that he could come back and share with us more. Last note, I know now he's um, expanding from landscape to landscape urbanism to really now hardcore city making. Um, there are a lot of buildings to be made and I I promise you we have great uh, faculty members, uh, great architects on the west coast that closer to the other side of the ocean would now be part of your city making act. Um, here is a lot of people, an architect's colleague sitting here and we could have continued dialogue on those. With that being said, once again, let's give a 